Hello and welcome to another episode of the Fully Charged Podcast. Um, what, I think it's a really, it is, I'm trying not to get too excited. <laughs> Look, you've got to forgive an old man. I, I sometimes get a bit excited about batteries and I just have to live with that. And I'm not allowed to talk about it in my house. I'm allowed to talk about it here in my little studio. But if I mention, mention batteries in the kitchen, I get that look. You don't want that look. Um, but I think they are clearly a critically important piece of the energy transition jigsaw. And that is exactly what this podcast is all about. Uh, today, I'm talking to a really amazing Norwegian man called Tom Jensen, who has is one of the co-founders of a company. And I'm going to try and do it in a slightly Norwegian way, Freyr which is a, a, a Norwegian god of peace and posterity, prosperity. Uh, and that's what it's named after. And it is, we're talking about uh, one of the gigafactories in Norway and now building gigafactories in the United States to produce vast amounts of batteries, mainly for uh, grid storage, for storage, storing wind and solar electricity when there's too much of it, which is often going to be happening, and then ha allowing us to use it when we do need it. And it's, um, it's just a fascinating conversation, and, it, and it's really worth listening to because of uh, his explanations of what batteries are, what they're made of, what we do with those materials, where those materials come from. Have we got enough materials to make the amount of batteries we need? We're talking multiple hundreds of terawatt hours. We're talking about petawatt hours of electricity storage being developed in the next 10 years. Really absolutely game-changing, absolutely undermining on an economic level, nothing to do with politics, nothing to do with tree-hugging or virtue signaling, where it will undermine economically the dominance of fossil fuels. It will not make sense to transport and burn fossil fuels once we can produce the energy locally and store it and use it later. It's going to take time. It's not, it's not, it's not going to happen overnight. It, it's a huge, geographically enormous technologically challenging enormous transition and it is very exciting time to be alive isn't that extraordinary who would have thought we'd be alive at a time when this was changing and it is changing and it's changing really really fast there's some key moments in this podcast that I think are very revealing so I don't want to waffle on about it anymore I do want to say we had an amazing time in Vancouver really brilliant and we're about to have in a few weeks an amazing time in Amsterdam. Really, really looking forward to it. They are always quite frightening for me because I have to I have to do so many talks and stuff and it's quite tiring for a poor old fella. But it's so energizing. And what the, the people we met in uh, Vancouver were just incredible. 90% Canadians, but lots of Americans came up from 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 down south. Uh, and we met such lovely people. It's such an amazing atmosphere to come to those shows. So if you are in the, you know, northwestern sector of the European superstate, and you can get to Amsterdam uh, for, for in November, the 20, 26th, hang on, I'll tell you. <laughs> it's the end of November. Where is it? Twenty. It is 24th, 25th, 26th of November the convention center and you can get the train there or the tram it's really easy and it's lovely and everyone's everyone everyone's lovely in the netherlands anyway everyone's lovely everywhere actually even even in this country there's lovely people <laughs> uh but no one is really as lovely as the canadians that re they really have got well the canadians and the the dutch those two they're really they are very very specially lovely um but let us now not waffle. Uh, please do tell your friends about this podcast and please do subscribe and all those things and leave us five-star reviews. That always is nice. On the Apple Podcasts app, you know how to do it. I've had a 12-year-old show me how to do it. I can, even I can do it. Okay, he was 13, little lad who showed me how to do it. You always need someone very young when you're at my age with new technology. But not with battery technology, which I do kind of understand. Yes, I say so myself. I'm just going to blow my own trumpet. <laughs> um, please welcome to the Fully Charged Show podcast, Tom Jensen from Freya Batteries. 
So, Tom, uh, for a start, thank you very much for persevering with Zencaster and the technical problems we had getting through, but it's working, which is fantastic. Uh, I, what I'd love to know is a little bit of the story of Freya, because I've heard of it. I know sort of what's happening now. Is that, am I saying it right, Freya? Is that the. Yeah, Freya the, is good. Yeah. Good. In, in Norway, uh, we would say Freyr, but, you know, that's oh. more of a Norwegian kind of, you know, Nordic oh, I want to say Viking, it like that. you know, Asgard <laughs> kind of thing. And it is, I mean, Freyr is actually a Nordic god, and, it, you know, for prosperity oh, right. okay. and fertility and a number of these kind of positively charged, pun intended, right. things, right, that that lies behind it. So, yeah, but right. Freyr is good. That's the kind of it's as good as I can Anglo-Saxon do. version of it. It's okay. <laughs> Well, we've got a lot. There's a lot of ancient connections between the, between the kind of England and or whatever this island, this damp island, and the the the, the far north <laughs> it goes back a long yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there we go. <laughs> but there we go. So what? So yeah. Uh, now I've talked to people from North Vault, which I believe is in the Arctic Circle in Sweden. Correct. But your your is your factory actually within the Arctic Circle? Is it that far north, well, or it's so, just so? So our Giga factory that we are developing right now, uh, right. we call it Giga Arctic. So right. it, it is. I mean, technically, it's not on the Arctic Circle, but it's not far from not it. Far. Okay? Right. Yeah. So it's kind of a couple of kilometers. Well, maybe you know, fifty yeah. kilometers, you know, away from the Arctic Circle or something. Uh, but but principally, it's um, it's there, right? It's right. in Moirana. It's a industrial township, um, about 400, 500 kilometers east, north, east, northeast of uh, where Nordvolt is building Nordvolt 1 in Sheffield, right. yeah, in Sweden. So it's yeah. in that same sort of geographical area, right? It's, it's right. pretty close to each other. Yeah. Uh, lots of people from Moirana have visited Nordvolt. Some people from Nordvolt have visited Freyr in Moirana. Right. Uh, what we are doing there, really, uh, Robert, is... Uh, so we built our first facility. Uh, so we have our first facility up and running. We are producing batteries as we speak. Right. Uh, come back to sort of the tech part and you know the story behind it. We're then building Giga Arctic, which are going to be eight production lines of the one that we have started up now. Wow. Uh, and then we've also started the process of developing Giga America, uh, which is yeah. in uh, Georgia. Uh, it's about 30, 35 minutes south of Atlanta, a place called right. Coweta County. Uh, and there we're building 10 production lines of the same uh, same structure. So all in all, we have projects in the making for about 18 uh, production lines, right. totaling some 67 gigawatt hours of nameplate capacity, lithium ion phosphate based batteries for the energy storage market predominantly. So right. that's kind of Freyr in a nutshell, if you like. Right. Uh, and I'm sure that we can talk about how we got there and why we got there and what we're thinking and market and everything. But but yeah. that's a little bit sort of framing it, right? So about 400 people, 300 plus full-time employees, and then a muscle of, let's call it, uh, consultants and others that we're drawing on uh, to not sort of over extend ourselves before we sort of do a stepwise approach, right, to everything in life. Um, listed on the New York Stock Exchange, one of the few Western Hemisphere exposures to the battery play wow. uh, with special emphasis on energy storage and LFP and tons of other stuff that we can talk about. But that's kind of right. you know, in a nutshell who we are. Yeah. But, the, but that is, I mean, that is, I'm incredibly impressed. And that is, and also, uh, well, okay, so here's a question because the, I've been to it, to Norway and Sweden in the winter in the Arctic Circle. I know that it's quite cold. For someone who hasn't grown up there, I found it quite challenging. But then, alternatively, I've also been to Atlanta, and it's not cold in Atlanta or in Georgia. Right. It's actually quite warm. So yeah. that's you know, from noth if nothing else, the the contrast between those the environments for those two factors. But is there a is there a reason you you located there rather than say outside Oslo or you oh, yeah. know, somewhere uh, further south? So, so when we started out, Freyer, uh, which we did. Uh, I mean, it was incorporated back in 2018, uh, and it was incorporated because we were inspired by the Swedes. You know, we were inspired by Nordvolt because at that time they were already making noises, you know, in the Nordic and Scandinavian realm on building gigafactories in Scandinavia. And to be honest, at that time, we didn't really, you know, we hadn't really thought about that. Is that even, you know, feasible? But when the Swedes were able to do it, we kind of figured that if the Swedes can do it, we can do it a little bit better kind of thing. And that's this right. friendly Norwegian-Swedish rivalry going on there. But what we really did at that time, Robert, was we asked ourselves, 
what is it Norway has to offer? Is there anything that Norway has to offer that can give us realism in establishing a competitive gigafactory development? Mm. And there are a couple of things that Norway has to offer that are relevant in this regard. One, we have a lot of, or we at least at that time, we had a lot of surplus renewable energy at very low cost. And in particular, you have surplus renewable energy in the north. Okay. Right. Okay. And in this in yeah. this region, so the Norwegian electricity sector is divided up into four different quadrants. It's NO one, two, three, four. We are in NO four, the northernmost part. Uh, when we decided to locate in this area, uh, there were about five to six terawatt hours of surplus green hydropower based electricity in the area. Wow. So, that's, so that uh, yeah. of course, battery is a reasonably energy intensive process. So that's kind of a big big reason for why we're in north. Uh, second reason uh, that we sort of looked at beyond sort of the availability of green electricity was Norway is a country where, um, let's call it process intensive and energy intensive industry acumen has been acquired over the last century or so. So Norway started its onshore, I would say, uh, industrial development back in 1905-ish. Uh, ah, and okay. since then... Norsk Hydro, the aluminium giant has been developed. A number of other energy and process intensive industries have been developed, harnessing, uh, you know, the hydropower base of Norway. Uh, and in the north and in this region that we have established ourselves in Muirana, that is an industrial township which has been built upon that heritage, if you like. Right. OK. So, so it's a very industrially friendly location. They understand shift labor. They understand the need to support industry. It's excellent um, logistics in and out from sea, rail, uh, road, and air. And now they're also building a new airport. So that's going to be make it even better. They're building a new deep sea K, which is going to make it better, etc. All of which is geared around industrial development. So right. the mayor, uh, the civil servants, everything in and around Muirana is geared to support industries like us. So that was a second sort of part of it. How can we leverage the industrial DNA? And the third part of why we chose Norway in general uh, is, so since the 60s, Robert, Norway has built and operated more than 100 oil and gas platforms out in the North Sea, Yeah. each of which are giga project developments, right? I mean, these right. are multi-billion dollar facilities in the harshest environment you can think of. Mm. And the ability to build and operate these facilities in a safe and quality conscious manner is, again, an industrial DNA that we really feel is important to embed in building yeah. a company like ours. So all of those things combined uh, and, of course, coming from the oil and gas and aluminium industry as founders of Freyer, uh, right. we figured, where do we go? So we went to these different locations that we had visited and have facilities in in the past. And we met with the relevant stakeholders. We spoke to some of our previous industrial colleagues, et cetera, and said, okay, where, if we want to build a gigafactory, where is the best place to build it? Yeah. And more often than not, Moirana came up on top. And this right. has been an extremely, you know, good decision from Freyr's perspective. Mm -hmm. We have been so welcome. Uh, as I said, we found a large kind of already brownfield building of 13,000 square meters where we built our first uh, production line. And we're now building the largest mainland building in northern Norway. And it's already 80,000 square meters big and 40 wow. meters in height. So it's one of those, you know, Just huge uh, enormous yeah. landmark kind of buildings that are now yeah. rising towards the sky. Uh, and the pride in the area, et cetera, is strong. So, I mean, yeah. Mm. Giga Arctic, fantastic development. As you say, come there from roughly now on up until April, and you know it's dark and cold, and you know, yeah. but the people are great, and yeah. uh, the climate is fantastic, and infrastructure, etc., is is uh, is enormous. So this is probably one of the best places to produce batteries in the world, in our opinion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is fascinating the the sort of recent history of Norway. Uh, there was a wonderful drama series. I don't want to go off topic too much, but it was so pertinent to this. An amazing drama series, Norwegian drama series we saw on British television. Okay. And it was a subtitled into English. Uh, and it was, a, it was basically a fishing village 
on the edge of Norway in like the uh, just after World War One, so uh, late forties, early fifties, and yeah, everyone yeah, yeah. worked. Work, you know, people it was fishing and some iron ore. You know, they did some. They referred to some industries, and then it was about the discovery of oil and gas in the North yeah. Sea, and yeah. then how people adapted from being fishermen into being running support vessels out to oil wells and yeah, the exactly. Americans coming in and the Russians coming in and the British and all. And, and you saw that and it sort of followed the transformation of Norwegian society because from what I gathered from that drama series and what seemed to be implied was Norway was not a wealthy country, say, in 1950 no, no. on global terms. It wasn't poor, but it wasn't like a, a very wealthy country where it's now, <laughs> thanks to people yeah. like us buying all your oil and gas. Yeah, there you go. And and, yeah. and moving forward, we need to transform from an oil and gas producing nation yeah. to a renewable energy exporting nation. And batteries are the pivotal central yeah. role in that transition. Yeah. So, so yeah. I mean, it's all about Norway's all, all, always been about. I mean, the, the 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 primary makeup of the Norwegian industrial let's call it sector has always been about producing and exporting energy or energy intensive yeah. products. Yeah. So Norway knows how to manage energy. And on top of this, of course, as you know, we are the country by far globally they have the highest adoption of electric vehicles yes and also the yeah. highest adoption of electric ferries and we all yeah. even have an ambition to electrify most of the short haul aviation routes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and yeah. and all of which is possible in 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 this you know no bullshit environment that we have sometimes yeah. we're a little bit slow, slow politicians may be a little bit careful etc but by and large we are quite good i think yes in how to manage, build, and operate energy and energy intensive assets. And that's yeah. part of the reason why we're in Norway and specifically why we're in Moira. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly an argument I've made and made recently about, I mean, the largest floating wind farm is now off the coast of Norway and it's yeah. in very deep water. So you wouldn't be able to put in, a, you know, floor mounted, seabed yeah. mounted wind farm. And it's amazing and it's huge and it powers a big, the biggest oil and gas rigs in the area. That's what it does. Yeah. It generates yeah. power. For, we should which, have lots more of them, by the way. So, should have lots of, yeah, yeah. yeah, but I mean, the point is, the two points are, one, people never calculate the amount of energy that is required to extract oil and gas. It's always the, the remnants of when we burn it. And tailpipe emissions, that's one of my bugbears. You know, it's quite a lot happens before you put it in your tank or in your, your heater. Indeed. But then... Also, it means that that technology has been developed. We could put, you know, you could put uh, wind turbines hundreds, thousands of miles off the coast, effectively, you could, you could. where it's always windy. You know, that's and, and the here's thing. an but idea anyway. for you, Robert. Here's yeah. an idea for you. Norway has developed 100-ish oil and gas platforms in the North Right. Sea, most of which are actually operating still today. Yeah. Imagine... Yeah. If we did as we did for the one you just mentioned, for all of these oil and gas platforms, yeah, and then we connect these oil and gas platforms with interconnectors, and then yeah. we connect part of it gradually, some of it to to the mainland, so that we can flex it up and down with the hydropower, yeah. and then we connect it to continental Europe and to the UK. Yeah. I mean, Norway is already, or some claim that Norway is Europe's green battery because we have this huge yeah. hydropower position, and we have seventeen or eighteen cables going to different parts of Europe. Yeah. Imagine what we could do if we oh. really sort of, you know, bombard the Norwegian continental shelf with floating offshore yeah. wind. I, I mean, sometime into the future, this is inevitable. The best yeah. wind resources in Europe outside Russia is offshore Norway. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's just one of those additional things when the world is transitioning from a fossil fuel era to yeah. a renewable energy era. Yeah. Norway is again blessed if we decide to sort of move in that direction. And it's inevitable. Yeah. Again, I said it's a little bit slow. We could have done more. We could have moved faster. Yeah. To your point, the yeah. products that have made Norway one of the richest countries on the planet, now we are doing our utmost to reduce the emissions of producing those products. Right. Yeah. But the bulk of the emissions coming from the products that have made us rich are emitting CO2 at the point of combustion, right? Yes, of course. Yeah. And it's like yeah. 10 times more. Yeah. Than what we do when producing that, right? Yeah. Or more. So yeah. anyway, you know all this, right? But um, yeah. but this is what. It's, so so in in saying that, I do believe that Norway has a responsibility actually beyond uh, what we're doing already. We have a responsibility to punch way above our weight because right. we have been very fortunate to discover all of this oil and gas yeah. that have created this super profit for us as a nation, 
and we should reinvest a reasonable chunk of that super profit into a much larger renewable energy position. And yeah. to be fair, we are, and yes. there is a lot of initiatives ongoing, but we oh, could yeah. do a lot more, and hopefully yeah. we are part of that equation. Yeah. And also, I'm an absolute critical central technology to that any of that any of that transition oops excuse me Absolutely. you've just mentioned is is batteries is how you store that energy when you because because i mean that's the one thing that's clear here we just had two nights where we went where our uh wholesale energy price went way below negative it went into the negative you know so you if you if you're on the correct tariff you get paid to charge your your car yeah. and heat your water you know at night so it is uh but the fact is that at that stage we're we're producing more than a hundred percent of the energy we need, and, we should and put we're all heading that in energy that energy into batteries, we, right? So yeah, that's, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, no, absolutely. So, uh, and this but then is what's that's happening. yeah, yeah. So that well, I mean, that was the thing I wanted to ask because that the other side of that, which is a, a, a discussion I've just had very recently with uh, people who work within uh, mineral, it's a, uh, within mineral extraction around the world. So yep. people who keep it, keep tabs on global mineral extraction, it's where the materials come from. And I think this is changing so rapidly, isn't it? But where the materials come from that you would use in that factory, because I'm assuming there isn't a massive supply of nickel, copper and lithium and cobalt in in northern Norway. Or am I wrong? <laughs> so, uh, no, no, you're not wrong. So, so the first thing I'd like to say is we've secured all the critical minerals and raw materials we need for the, the sort of immediate future. OK, right. so all of our gigafactories have been secured. Uh, and we have this ability to securing all of those minerals uh, also outside of Asia in general and in right. China in particular in the not so distant future. So yeah. uh, and not that we, you know, necessarily are negative to sourcing our materials from China. It's just that we are moving towards a world where regional energy security and regional security of supply of critical inputs yeah. into what you're going to produce is going to be increasingly important, right? And yeah. and beyond that, it makes a lot of sense if you can process it close to where you're actually using it and so on. But to answer your question, um, most of the minerals and metals, they are typically mined where they have been discovered to date, right? Yeah. And, and typically, many of these inputs have been discovered in South America or in Africa and Australia. Just yeah. so happens that most of it's been processed in China, right? Yeah, yeah. So you extract nickel in well Indonesia primarily. You extract cobalt in West Africa primarily. Yeah. You extract lithium in South America and other parts. You know, and, and and but and but there are huge deposits of lithium in Europe, and there are in right. Scandinavia both lithium and cobalt. The the largest Western Hemisphere nickel, cobalt, and copper processing facility is a Glencore facility in Norway called Nickelberg. So there right. actually a lot of materials that go into, uh, let's call it the energy transition, are processed already in Norway. Norway right. is a huge producer of both natural and synthetic graphite, which is the core ingredient into anodes, as you know, yeah. So uh, and so on and so forth. So will you see, well, what you will see, in our opinion, is that you will see localization of the processing of metals and minerals close to where the gigafactories are going to be. Yeah. And if there is going to be, and we think there's going to be a battery belt in Scandinavia, Northvolt, right. Freyir, maybe a couple of others, that will develop large gigawatt hour scale facilities. And therefore, you will tend to have a gravity pull for that yeah. processing of metals and minerals. And we actually are engaging in that ourselves, in particular on the cathode side for lithium ion phosphate cathodes. So we right. are aiming to establish cathode production. Uh, in the Nordic region to supply our Nordic uh, gigafactories and the Norwegian one in particular. Right. Uh, and then we, of course, we, and that's the collective we, the big sort of battery industry, the whole value chain, will obviously be, because of the exponential nature of the demand growth and the need to sort of secure localized supply, people will start to figure out how to extract lithium and other metals from less known deposits or less obvious deposits and or through different technologies where you can actually extract it from sources you hadn't thought about. Yeah. We like to say that lithium is like money. It's everywhere. And it's yeah. more than enough of it. You just have yeah. to find the right source. Um, yeah. The one the one thing I'd like to, you know, that I normally mention, not that we necessarily are looking at it, but there is this initiative ongoing to extract brine from the Rhine. 
right? So oh, wow. there, there wow. is lithium concentration in the rhine, okay? Wow. And, and that's naturally occurring. That's not natural, industrial well, waste. And then, of course, you have geothermal wells that come yeah, up yeah. and they have much higher concentration and so on and so forth. Yeah. My point is not to, to cherry pick or to say that this or the other is yeah. going to happen. All I'm saying is that the lithium supply 10 years from now is going to be dramatically different from what we're thinking today because we just yes. don't know. Yeah. If you think about it, in, 19, in 2005, Robert, who had thought that shale oil and shale gas in the U.S., would yeah. be one of the largest sources of energy supply on the planet. Yeah. yeah. And that is 18 years ago, my friend, right? Yes. And now it's like 10 million barrels of oil equivalents a day. Yeah. So, and, and this is just what progress and, you know, opportunity, et cetera. Yeah. It just moves in that direction. So to summarize, we have secured all the critical minerals and metals we need for our immediate plants. We have this ability to having that fully locally processed in the not so distant future, think five right. years into the future. And then three, we are together with a bunch of others looking at the metals and minerals that we can actually extract through different means so that we can also have the complete value chain, if at all relevant and possible, in the areas which we operate. But right. The, the crust, uh, I mean, there is more than enough of the metals and minerals that we need for a fully decarbonized world, even a world that has 200 terawatt hours of batteries deployed can be sustained with the metals and minerals on the planet by a factor right. of four to 10, right? right. So, so it's not like as if we're going to run out of this stuff. Yeah. And then at the end of the day, we're going to recycle. Yes. Well, that was one of, of the questions I want to ask. Yeah. yeah a lot yeah. of it, right? And, yeah. and, and there are different trains of thoughts and different sort of schools and different ways in which people are thinking about this. And, you know, I respect all of that. But, you know, some people claim maybe as much as 80% of all the metals yeah. and minerals we need can be sourced from urban mining or recycled, yeah. you know. Now, so that still means that you need 20% on a continuous basis. If you start to look at that, uh, yeah. and you contrast that against, you know, proven reserves and cr proven resources and where they are, et cetera, there will be some temporary bottlenecks here and there. And, you know, from time to time, a year here is going to be short supply of lithium and then price yeah. mechanisms will dictate that, you know, more supply that, that comes into the market and so on. But, you know, all in all, there's no fundamental shortage. Okay. No. And, and, you know, there is going to be this very circular, much better system where we track and trace almost every molecule, right, from uh, cradle to cradle, right? So it's not yeah. going to be a cradle to grave anymore. Grave. No, fossil that's the fuel, difference. Yeah. Fossil, fuel, fossil fuels is cradle to grave. This yeah. is not that. This is cradle to cradle. So this is, yeah. you know, continuous loop, circularity. Yeah. And that's the beauty of it, because then we get better and better at technology, and batteries are technology, solar is technology, wind is yeah. technology, but feedstock, solar and wind, free, zero. Cost, marginal yeah. cost, zero. Battery yeah. cost going to drop continue to drop every time we double cumulatively installed capacity it's just going to get more and more cost competitive yeah and then ultimately everyone is going to have their energy bill slashed by a factor of 50 percent or 60 percent or 80 percent it's right. just the virtue of learning curves yeah uh, and as we transition into this renewable energy system everything is going to be a lot cheaper also on the energy side but right. of course today in the current European framework and context with Russia having invaded Ukraine and therefore all the gas from Russia is all of a sudden shut down overnight yeah. and Norway needs to step up and, you know, pump all the gas it can. And then, of course, all the electricity, you know, is being increased in demand. So all of a sudden, everyone had a 2x, 3x energy bill increase. And it's very hard in that context to sort of envisage that, you know, solar and wind 10 years down the line or 15 years yeah. down the line is just going to dramatically change that. But that's what's happening. And yeah. batteries are the core catalyst for that. And we couldn't be happier to be in this industry. Because that's, I mean, there's a couple of things I want to, because that's a fantastic description of that. But a couple of things I wanted to make sure I we cover is the fact that what you're, the, it's, it sounds like the focus of what you're manufacturing is for, you know, I call it static storage, not for transport. It's for energy storage in relation to the grid and, and electricity supply. Is that correct? I mean, is that where the majority of what you're making? Is, yeah. So, so this is, is this has been our primary focus area, uh, just because many weren't focusing too much on that, and we've actually yeah. always been of the opinion that a 
the energy transition is about decarbonizing transportation, but it's also about decarbonizing energy supply. Yeah. Okay. And that requires 20 times more solar and wind deployments globally. Yeah. And when you 20 fold intermittent energy, you need to store sunlight when it isn't shining and you need to store wind when it isn't blowing. Yeah. And of course, when you're intelligent about putting up these wind and solar farms in different areas, you will do so in a manner where they are, you know, naturally correlated. And then you yeah. will input in four hour, eight hour, 12 hour storage facilities. And when you start to play around with these things, proven technologies as they are today, there is there is no reason why we shouldn't have a fully decarbonized grid, no. uh, meaning only powered by solar and wind plus storage. There's already been tons of studies done on this in the US where they yeah. can actually cut costs by 50% by implementing solar and wind and four hour batteries completely right. over the entire continental USA. And then of right. course it's possible to do it in Europe as well. So we saw that trend early. Uh, we have always been of the opinion that energy or ESS applications are gonna be the core part of decarbonizing the power sector. And therefore we went all in in that sector but that yeah. doesn't mean that we're not going to develop or produce batteries and don't have customers that also are in the mobility space because we yeah. do lots right. of people who want to buy our batteries that are uh, commercial vehicle producers, things right. delivery trucks, buses, other types of mechanism that don't necessarily require the same technical characteristics as an EV. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, you want to tailor make, and this is also something that is happening a lot more than most people think. Batteries are becoming more and more fungible, but also more and more individually adapted to different market segments. Yeah. So a lithium-ion battery is not a lithium-ion battery. The one no. that you put into a Mercedes e EQS is completely different from what we will put into a 40-foot container to store yeah. something. Yeah? yeah. So but yeah. we focused on that first, but we are going to, uh, I mean, we don't discriminate our customers. We uh, we listen right. to them. If they want Freyer batteries, the cleanest battery solutions on the planet, and we believe also the most cost effective, we are ready. And we will right. be able to supply anyone and everyone, maybe not immediately, but over time, we're going to be a leading provider of battery solutions for everything. But ESS is our core focus right now. And we have secured more than 100 gigawatt hours worth of cumulative demand for, for those plants, which support a large part of the initial development of both Giga Arctic and Giga America. Right, and then right. let's see how much more we add on yeah. top of that. But demand is, it's not, it, the market is not the problem. Yeah, it's no. The, uh, the problem is how to build these facilities, how to finance them, yeah. and how to sort of move that in tandem, et cetera. But, you know, we're listed on the New York Stock Exchange. We've raised over more than a billion dollars to date. And we're one of those, you know, players to be reckoned with, we think. Yeah. Uh, but I also want to say, Robert, that this is, this is not trivial. This is extremely hard. Yeah. I mean, yeah. when I started the company with my co-founders some five, six years ago, I had absolutely no clue of how hard right. this how was to do going it. to right. be. Oh, yeah, yeah, I bet. Yeah. But I mean, we've done some good things and we've been able to uh, cross a couple of sort of bridges that were narrow and shaky and all of that. But here we are. And we are 400 people and we're three facilities, one up and running, the second in the making and the third in the making, and a suite of extremely dedicated and professional individuals that are from the Norwegian oil and gas and aluminium industry, but also, you know, battery experts from around the world, 26 or more nationalities in the company right now, right, right. all fully charged, I should say, <laughs> to really sort of yeah. drive the energy transition from a Norwegian vantage point. But I mean, that is, I do, uh, the, the couple of things that you said there that have sort of sparked memories of uh, in other industries. So one of the areas I've talked to a couple of times are people who, the, 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 this is British engineers who worked in offshore oil and gas in the North Sea and then, and now work in the oil, uh, offshore wind. Yep. And they've just, I mean, they, you know, it, it, on a very crude level, they're very good at putting enormous metal things in the sea that don't fall over. That's, a, that's, right. that's the, that's that's the right. gist of it. And that's what you want with a wind turbine. You know, you, it's in massive construction. They now had to sink it into the seabed. They now had to keep it up right. But that was, a, you know, so they've got, a, they've all got a job for life. I mean, some of these guys I've met are like my age, retirement age, and they're still working because there's such demand for their skills. And that seems to be a similar thing from what you're saying is that 
you know, certainly a problem we've heard a lot about is the skill shortage. You know, that we, if you want to fit a, a heat pump in your house in this country, there's a very limited number of technicians that are capable of doing it well. There's quite a yeah. lot of people who would throw a heat pump in your garden and do it badly, but, you know, to get someone good. But it sounds like, are you, have you not, you've not had huge challenges finding skilled staff? Is that, is, or, or is, well, that, is so, that a challenge? So, well, it's definitely a challenge. So I yeah. don't want to, uh, you know, underestimate that challenge. Um, having said that, we have, knock on wood, so far been able to attract the talent we need. Right. And there are a couple of reasons for this. We are building what we label next generation battery technology or semi solid right. technology. Yeah, because I no. want to ask about semi solid. Yeah. We'll do that yeah. in a minute. Yeah. And, and, and what that means is that it's a technology, it's an MIT spin off. It was founded 15 years ago by one of the most renowned material science professors on this planet, a gentleman called Yat Ming Chang. Uh, and he figured that, you know, if batteries are now going into vehicles and into containers to store large amounts of electricity, uh, probably not very suitable for them to be very small, like these cylindrical. Yeah batteries, right? Because if you put how many cylindrical batteries you think you need in a contain 40 foot container, I mean, it's just, just tens of thousands. Of, yeah. And, and, and I mean, there's so much dead weight and dead space in that. So he was kind of figuring, we need to be able to produce batteries that are larger and thicker. Because if they're larger, and more prismatic or more rectangular, and, yeah. and much thicker, we just need less of them. And then it's yeah. more efficient on how you produce it, etc, etc. So that's what we decided to, to develop after a long sort of process, we were looking for, I mean, we basically were looking all over. We spoke to everyone, all the Asian players, all the relevant ones. We spoke to all of the startup companies in Europe, all the startup companies in the US. And we were looking for a couple of very cool things. Um, and we landed on 24M, which is the technology that we have licensed and which we right. now started production of in our first facility. Uh, so... That also means, because the, one of the selection criteria was that this should offer a step change in performance and cost. And this is a technology that is much more space efficient because we have eliminated more than half of the production steps from right. the design right. of the process itself. And that allows us to shrink the footprint of the facility quite dramatically, which means that the capital expenditure goes down. And it also means that the energy consumption goes down. But it also means that we can automate and digitalize the production much more. So what that means from a competence point of view is that relative to conventional technology, I think we will see more people running around with iPads in our production sites. Right. Most of people that are tweaking a conveyor belt or sort of, we will yeah. have that too. But I mean, so we think we can actually triple the amount of batteries produced per employee relative right. to a conventional technology. And this is driven by digitalization. So right. what that means from a competence point of view is that we can probably retrain in a more simple way many of the disciplines that we need in a gigafactory right. more so than a conventional solution could. Right. Okay, So that's why, and, and so far, again, knock on wood, we've been able to attract everyone. Uh, we have battery experts from all over the world that want to come to Muirana, right? Even right. at this time of year yeah. and, and live there and work there because they're sort of, again, they're fully charged with the mission, okay? Yeah. yeah, They really like what we're doing. We want to create the cleanest, most cost-effective battery solutions to the planet. Right. We want to do it in a no bullshit manner. We just want to move ahead and sort of deliver these things to catalyze the energy transition. Yeah. That's who we are, and that's resonating. And so far, we've been able to attract everyone we need. Uh, and we need a third as many as the other guys, right? right. Which helps us quite a lot, you yeah. know? Uh, so the, the challenge is there, and everyone is kind of fighting for the same resources. We're fighting for slightly different competence profile on average, right. and we're fighting for a third as many. So therefore... And are we offering, you know, who, who we are and the vision and, you know, our yeah. values and what makes us tick and so on. And yeah, it's, it's not, it's, it's been a headache, but not too much of a headache. Let's right, go. right. But can you explain then in relatively basic terms <laughs> for the non, for the non-material scientist and battery scientist, what, what, what semi-solid 
what what you mean by semi solid yeah. okay. because I think I almost understand but because yeah. I've, so, I've so the very discussed simple, batteries a great deal but the yeah, simple the version system. of this is when yeah. you're making a conventional battery you're creating this slurry which is this liquid slurry you're taking metal powder the cathode yeah. powder so that's nickel manganese cobalt oxide or lithium ion phosphate you're mixing it with solvents which are liquid so you yeah. create this paint like slurry okay the paint viscosity okay so it's thickish and yeah. then you coat these current or, or, or this slurry onto the current collectors, the aluminium and copper foil, okay? Right. Cathode anode, and you put them together with a separator in between. But you can't have wet batteries, right? So you need to extract these solvents so that you dry them out. And that's why you, that's the rate limiting step of producing conventional batteries, because they need to go through seven, eight hundred degrees C, and that you know it's only so fast you can do that, blah blah yeah. blah. Big ovens, and, and yes, yeah. so, I've seen so that. So what yeah. 24M did was that, and then at the end of the process, when you put them into these coiled cylindrical things or in these prismatic yeah. solutions, you fill in liquid electrolyte, okay? Yeah. Now, what Yet Ming Chang did was that he used the liquid electrolyte to mix it with the metal powder up front. And that oh, right. creates okay. this clay-like structure. So it's it's almost like magic sand, if you remember when you right. were a kid. Yeah? Yeah. So, and that is dry. It's not dry coating, but it's more like clay. Some call it clay right. batteries, okay? Right. So then instead of coating it kind of like paint, yeah. you're casting it, you're sort of pressing it down almost like gingerbread, okay? Right. Wow. And that's the difference. Same yeah. metal, same minerals, same electrolyte, but mixed right. together up front in a gingerbread-like fashion. And that's an right. economist explaining batteries, right? <laughs> And then you're pressing that gingerbread so that it's uniform and you know evenly distributed, et cetera, et cetera, onto much larger batteries. Right. And the 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 word semi-solid speaks to the structure of that material. So it's right. like half hard. Let's put it that way. Okay. Yeah. It's not halfway to solid state, even though it does offer many of the same benefits as solid state would do. Right. So that's the reason why it's called semi-solid. Yeah. Uh we are the first one to take it to gigawatt hour scale. We're up and right. running with our first facility in that right now. So we're extremely excited about where we are. It has not gone without headache and not gone without yeah, sure. challenges for sure. Yeah. But yeah, so that's the sort of semi-solid story. Okay. And also does that, I mean, it sounds like from a complete outsider's point of view, but I've been around a, a couple of battery factories where, where they're making cylindrical cells and i've also strangely enough been around a baked bean factory and there were similarities at times when there's thousands of baked bean cans going past you every minute or thousands of little batteries but yep. it sounds like that's got to be a cheaper way of producing la large num large storage capacity it, it, you know because you, because you're not making millions of little cells i mean that's no, what no, no. i uh, mean so so ideal i mean we think we can produce ultimately so our batteries right now is about 56 centimeters long and 10 centimeters wide and right. a lot thicker than you know other batteries but principally there is no reason why we shouldn't be able to make them even longer and even wider and even right. thicker. okay and i mean just think about it when you want to put large uh container-like solutions to store sunlight yeah. and wind much better to have flat large square bulky things and yeah. uh, stacked on top of each other as opposed to these cylindrical yeah that you need to encode in modules and packs and so so yeah it should be a lot cheaper we think when we are at scale at gigawatt hour scale that we can produce batteries 20 percent plus cheaper than anyone else right right so that's a big plus isn't it it's a big plus and and yeah. it's also a lot of savings in the downstream part of it this is just on the battery cell part right. but when you're implementing that into the container itself there should be huge savings in the container itself and we have right. Right. Lots of strong partnerships with Nidec and with Siemens and with Caterpillar and with a bunch of others that we've already announced. And, you know, it's in the public domain. Yeah. And part of the reason why they really like what we're doing is the fact that we can offer these, you know, whole value chain savings perspective yeah. beyond yeah. the fact that our batteries are, are, are going to be much better than, than the alternative. Yeah, because yeah. that was the other thing. Recently, we've um, seen a couple of very large uh, uh, quarrying equipment you know, which was traditionally always diesel. And one, and this is one of the things where, you know, the, the, the double assumption is one, oh, well, the batteries won't last all day. They won't do a shift. 
and also, uh, you know, ba and then batteries are really heavy. And it's exactly the other way around. It's they desperately want to put more batteries. This was a really big, uh, uh, you know, a hydraulic digger, like a quarry scale digger we saw that Volvo have developed. And they had to put more batteries in because they needed the weight. <laughs> it's the exact yeah, opposite yeah, yeah. of a car. You know, yeah. they don't want it to be light because if it's light, it, it tips over. You know, it needs to have that solidity to do the job it, it does. And cat and there, there's also uh, Caterpillar quarry trucks in, I know, in Australia, I mean, which we're going to I mean, we need to decarbonize mining. Um, yeah. we need to, I mean, so everything needs to be decarbonized, right? And everything yeah, yeah. can run on batteries. So, so we are, I mean, biased as we are, we fundamentally believe that batteries can probably play a role in close to 80% of all decarbonization efforts globally, Yeah. right? When it comes to industry. I mean, yeah. it's obvious for electric vehicles. It's obvious for anything yeah. that moves, whether it's by sea or by air. But yeah. it's also increasingly important in decarbonizing industry and, yeah. and of course, uh, energy systems. And, and, and it's still not resonating well enough, I think, in the energy space, how important of a factor large, you know, 20, 25-year cycled products can play in this realm, yeah. right? We are looking for a world where or we are moving into a world, I should say, that 20 years from now, energy costs catalyzed by batteries will be 80% lower than what they are today. Which is, I mean, if that t comes about, it, it's such a huge economic shift. It's really hard to calculate the, the knock-on effects and it's of that. probably 80% yeah. leaner too, Robert, because right. imagine yeah. today we're transporting oil and gas all over the planet yeah. in huge tanker ships. In, and the huge... volume of that stuff that yeah. we combust... Yeah. And because, I mean, more than 50% of the, the, the energy content is lost, right? Yes, yes, yeah. So, so it's hugely inefficient system, yeah. if you just think about it. Yeah. And I'm an oil and gas man originally, so it's right. not like as if I don't understand these things. Yeah. But, I mean, there is such a bad... I mean, homo sapiens have, thank God, been able to figure out just in time, maybe, let's hope, yeah. you know, a way to get out of, you know... Uh, the predicament that we're in, yeah. but that means deploying, pardon my French, shitloads of these things. Yes, right? yes, and, and we just need Absolutely. to need to get on with it. Get on with it. Because I mean, also, I think it. I think the other thing is that the general public, you know, are, are, are willfully misinformed for a start. But let's leave that to one side. But also, they just don't know. I mean, why would you know? But it's only recently I've discovered that if, say, Tesla existed in 1990, so 33 years ago. And because um, uh, the technology of the batteries did exist then, lithium ion batteries was in existence that long ago. If they'd done that, then uh, it would, a, a Tesla battery and a Tesla Model S would cost about $1 million in 1990. So by 2010, it was still really expensive. It was then about $60,000. And now it's about seven and a half thousand dollars and that's what's happened in that time so that change when you and to explain that to people is really hard because when you i remember having a video camera with a lithium iron rechargeable battery in 1990 and it was so exciting <laughs> but it was also really expensive and it was tiny you know it was exactly it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was and that uh, that I mean, yeah. cost reduction is phenomenal same with solar panels same with wind turbines Yep. You know, those cost reductions are really hard because they don't happen overnight. They happen over like a 10, a decade, don't they? But that's right, that's right. It does make a massive difference. But then, okay, so the really the most, uh, this is because this has been so brilliant. Thank you so much, John. This has been really fascinating. But one of the key things that is cl clearly resonates with everyone as regards this, and that's what I, because that's my argument I always make. I go, show me half a litre of recycled diesel and I'll go and buy a diesel car. <laughs> and that's the big difference is that, and it has to be, a, it's a critically important difference is that the, the stuff we're digging up now, we can reuse. Now, whether we will or not is still up for debate. There's clearly a lot of energy and money and, in, uh, and uh, invention going into recycling. And, uh, but it's, it's a, surely a critical part of it. Is that something that you you are either involved in or directly doing or oh, yeah, thinking yeah. about in terms of how you make the batteries in the first place? Absolutely. So, I mean, right. this technology is also imminently more recyclable because it's simpler in its kind yeah. of chemical composition and uh, it's smaller. So, but, but I mean, I just want to manage expectations around recycling because, I mean, 
we are designing these batteries to last for more than 20 years. Okay. Yes. So, yes. So of course we are doing in process recycling. So scrap in the production process, you know, we will recycle and that's easier than conventional tech. And then we're also doing the same for the battery's end of life and huge business opportunities in that. Norway is always at the forefront of these things. So already a big recycling facility in Norway. So yeah, I mean, for, recycling is at the top of our agenda for sure. But yeah. I mean, it, it's it's a little bit, I wouldn't call it hyped, but it's a little bit, I mean, as a source of feedstock near term. Yes, it's, it's too probably, early, yeah, too yeah. soon. Yeah, yeah. But is it important? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's the, I think that's the fascinating thing is the more people I've talked to who work in that field, they're basically they're essentially what they're they're not putting it in quite so many words, but they're basically twiddling their thumbs. They're recycling old phones and old laptops and old you know uh, domestic electronics, but they're not really recycling uh, automotive batteries yet because the 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 batteries are still fine. That's right. You know they still That's work. Right. They're not yeah. they're not stopping all of a sudden as we were kind of led to believe early on in uh, no, world no, of no. electric. But I mean clearly in say I don't know what it is say twenty years time there's going to be you know. A billion electric cars on, on the planet or close to, yeah, you know, yeah. it's going to be a gonna lot. Be lots of batteries that lot. we can recycle. So it's, yeah, it's, it's yeah. one of those, you know, S curves that are just following five, 10 years down the line kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. But then, I mean, that's the, so the, the, you did mention those. I'd just like to finish on that because it is the other argument I hear is, oh, there's no way you could make enough batteries to power the world for a week when it's dark and cold. And you go, well, no, because you would never do that. But it's so difficult to, explain how you know the big batteries i've seen how they're used i mean they're not going they're not like charged up full and then it goes dark and then they empty themselves it, they're no, no, constantly no. Yeah. feeding into the grid and at imagine a times. world where you have a billion of these vehicles right or two billion right yeah and each of them have a 70 kilowatt hour battery and each of them yeah. are connected to the grid in a well, bi-directional yeah, exactly. cable so and yeah. then you have intelligent metering on all of them and then you have huge battery banks in yeah. in containers all around the world so on and so forth of course we can do this i mean it's, it's right. people who say that it can't be done are the ones who benefit from it can it, it not happening so right. yeah. this is technically feasible it's proven at you know simulations for for all regions i mean there's no question yeah yeah, which is very reassuring. And it's down to people like you and there are other people producing batteries that that understand that and that make uh, yeah. that are making this happen. Because that's, So let's just finish on the American one then. So that is, you know, so a thing we've talked about a lot on the show recently is the in, in Internal Revenue Act. Has that helped you, the IRA in the Absolutely. United States? Is I mean, that, the Inflation so Reduction Act is the yeah, Inflation child. Reduction Act, sorry. Yeah, it's the poster child for incentivizing the the uh, energy transition yeah and every government around the world should look to the us in this regard it has yeah. made us competitive with china yeah. and that was the main reason behind it second reason was mitigating climate change third reason was to accelerate energy deflation and um, right. so we have accelerated our plans in the us as a direct result of the ira and we're seeing similar things happening in and around europe so we are very charged up about it and it's cool yeah. you know yeah and I don't want to say anything too denigrating about my own country, but <laughs> you didn't decide to come here. <laughs> Sorry, just had oh, to say well, that. I, mean, I had to let that out. We've, we've always had sort of a both sides of the Atlantic kind of ambition. Yeah. I mean, you never rule out where we're going to go next. But uh, yeah. let's look. I mean, building two gigafactories is a tall order. Let's focus on these big... two first. And then, yeah. then, you know, we're coming to a theater near you. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> That's a very good. Oh well, that's been it's been fascinating talking to you, Tom. Thank you so much for for explaining things, and also you know just being you know it's just been a fascinating uh, experience to hear you and what you're doing. And I mean, I'm really, really impressed. I really wish you well with it. I think uh, everyone that listens to this show will be uh, rooting for you and thinking this is fantastic. So really, well, really thank good. you very much, Robert. Thank you. Well, I really hope you enjoyed that. Not going to waffle on. Please do subscribe. I did mention it before, but I'll mention it again. Uh, there's lots of other really brilliant people uh, that we've got uh, already recorded or we're about to record uh, uh, for Fully Charged podcasts. And uh, as I mentioned before, please do check out fullycharged.show uh, where all the information about our future shows are. The next few are, I can tell you now, Amsterdam in November. Um Sydney, Australia, in February of 2024, followed by Farnborough 
Uh, no, not followed by Farnborough. Followed by, it's all changed, XL in London, in uh, I think in early May, and then Harrogate in later in May. And then we don't, I can't even remember after that. That's enough. That's enough for now. Uh, that's all. Uh, as always, if you have been, thank you for listening. <laughs>